Hello, I'm Deborah Pittman, and I'm a clarinetist, ceramic artist, and a writer. And uh, welcome to my interview. Well, great. We're so happy to have you. Well, what I always like to ask artists is, why do you create art? What is your inspiration? What, what feeds your soul? Well, um, what generally feeds my soul is other people's art. I get a lot of uh, inspiration from, um, from painting, from sculpture, glasswork, metalwork, from poetry. Um, sometimes I'm watching something on television and then I have to like turn off the TV and make some sketches and turn that into something that's re a reflection of what I've seen on the screen, but coming from me. About how long have you considered yourself to be an artist? I would say at least 25 years. Um, I mean, I've always been an artist through the clarinet, and I started playing clarinet when I was 10. As a classical clarinetist, most of my art has been um, playing music by other people, a lot of them long dead. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's one of the things that sent me into looking for another voice, which is what I find in the ceramics and in the writing. Sure, I mean, recently I've gotten into Zen Tangle, of all things, mm -hmm. uh, because I don't draw. And I would like to put marks on my pottery that I've actually created myself. And so I've gotten into learning a lot of these different um, patterns, and I love that. Uh, so that's a new, that's a new ex area of exploration for me. What type of pottery do you enjoy creating most? One of my favorite shapes is the tripod, um, a pot with three different legs. It, it kind of looks like, how's that piece standing, especially when it's photographed in 2D? I like those pots. I probably like them a lot also because they're a big challenge. And I'm still at a point with my tripods where maybe one out of every eight tripods make it. Mm. So maybe that's what keeps my interest. Um, and I also make urns. I, I like the idea of um, the ashes, uh, the soul, the essence of the person having a beautiful place to reside in for the rest of eternity. So that's becoming a, a fast growing interest of mine. Uh, cremation urns. Your surfaces are so intricate and beautiful. How do you do it? Where does that inspiration come from? Well, so I've had this long-standing interest, um, fascination in uh, windows and entrances into places, windows and doors. And um, I learned how to do um, pierced pottery, it's called, mm -hmm. pierced pots, uh, a few years ago. And um, although it's a, it's a technique that takes a lot of time, you have to come back to the clay at just the right moisture level uh, or else it'll collapse. And you have to pretty much finish the piercing in one uh, sitting. Wow. If it doesn't crack while you're piercing it, it's gonna crack in the fire. How long does it take to fire your pieces? Well, that varies also. I mean, I like to do a lot of um, raku firing which is what's called a quick firing technique so that you don't have to wait um, 15 hours for the piece to fire and then the uh, kiln to cool. It happens rather rapidly. You can fire something in as little as 30 minutes. But I really like that because A, I don't have a lot of patience. And B, I like a lot of pots that don't have, I like pots that don't have a lot of glaze on them. I don't okay. like super shiny surfaces. And so, um, a lot of times you can fire something in a raku kiln and not have any color on it at all. And you get the textures that you put into the piece um, coming out in greater detail. Um, so yeah, I really like, I like the surface. I like the skin of the pot. Okay. And recently I've been working with a lot of porcelain because it has a very, very refined skin. And I've been working with Cassius clay, where I know this is a funny name, but Cassius clay is a black clay body that is like a black porcelain. And it's a pretty ornery clay, <laughs> but uh, I, I like the challenge. What happens after the raku firing? It's a function of um, taking the piece out at a certain temperature and either burying it in pine needles or in um, leaves or of some kind of other reduction material. Um, sometimes you can use crumbled up newspaper. And um, there's a, another technique where you wrap the, the piece of pottery in a whole roll of toilet paper hmm. and you seal it in a container. And when you open that, 
all of that carbon from the burning toilet paper has gone into the pot. And so you have a whole different kind of black atmosphere. And that's, that's pretty exciting too. Um, for a long time in my pottery life, I really enjoyed making the pot much more than actually firing it. Excellent. But um, I, ha I have a great respect for the fire, even to this date. And I've probably been firing my own pottery for at least 20 years. But to this, to this day, when I open the, when I set up the Raku kiln, I'm out there and I have to like give myself a little kick and say, okay, light it. Cause I put that off and I put that off and, and then I light it and it wasn't such a big deal and it wasn't so hard, but I am really bowing down and respecting the fire because of its awesome power. Where do you create your artwork? I have a studio out uh, in Oak Park at the Brick House Gallery. And that used to be tremendously um, convenient for me because I used to live in Oak Park, uh, 125 steps away from the gallery. Um, but so I've been in that gallery for maybe about five or six years, and that's worked out really nicely for me. Even though I've, I don't, I no longer reside in that area, I still keep my studio there, and um, my kiln, my Raku kiln, kilns plural are out back, and um, my stu inside my studio I have my. Um, electric kiln where I do the first firing and you know sometimes I do create pieces that have glaze on it so I fire that indoors also but if you're asking about my favorite I really like um, what they call naked clay. Okay. Do you sometimes have your studio open and or have yes, studio uh, shows? Or? Absolutely I, I participate in the uh, Sacramento Open Studio Tour which takes place in September every year and um, and then in, in Oak Park, there's a, an event uh, every third, third, third Saturday. Uh, I forget what it's called. I'm going to have to look that up. But I usually open for that event also once a month. If I don't, if I don't have a concert, I'm there. Um, and that's really nice. People stop in. Somehow with that setting, there's less pressure to buy something. And just people watch me throw. They watch me create. Um, they watch me pierce the pottery, which is always a little scary for them. No, you're not going to cut that surface. It's so symmetrical. But and I think and I think my attraction to the pierced pottery comes from my love of asymmetry. So you create something on the wheel so that you get this great symmetry and balance, and then I destroy that symmetry and balance by cutting it or by decorating it with some kind of um, texture or surface or design on the skin of the pot. Yeah. So how has being a black artist impacted your work and life? Um, so the impact has been very interesting because uh, with the, the focus with a lot of organizations on February as Black History Month, it winds up being the busiest month of the year for me. And I have basically have to tep take a step back and figure out which projects I'm going to participate in because there's only so much I can do in February. Um, uh, but there are some organizations out there that have um, experienced my art, my music, my writing, and then given me the opportunity to be an artist, a black artist, in other months of the year, which mm. is which is very exciting. Um, as a clarinetist, I just have to say that almost all my life, when people find out I play clarinet, they make the assumption that I play jazz. Mm. And... Uh, that, that's definitely a connection to um, my, my black heritage and expectations of my audiences. And, you know, I'm a retired um, university professor, and I'm always a person that's very interested in expanding the canon. So what our students are taught in the school, in the schools, needs to be expanded so that they have an, up, an idea that... Um, Art isn't just about the Renaissance or Leonardo da Vinci and, and those guys, or um, black art wasn't just created during the Harlem Renaissance. So I would, I would love to see an expansion and opening of the canon to include much uh, greater diversity in terms of what we're teaching our kids because they're going to become the board mem members of the future, the people who are supporting the arts, the people who are going out to see it and going out to purchase it. And um, it has to move beyond just like, wow, that's a pretty piece of pottery. Well, welcome to the Art for the Soul show. And uh, the black artists represented are uh, from many genres, many different genres, kind of like what you're saying. It's not just one, one size fits all. 
Right. So anyway, well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me.